Speakers, publishers, consultants, coaches, and info marketers unite. The Speaking of Wealth Show is your roadmap to success and significance. Learn the latest tools, technologies, and tactics to get more bookings, sell more products, and attract more clients. If you're looking to increase your direct response sales, create a big-time personal brand, and become the go-to guru, the Speaking of Wealth Show is for you. Here is your host, Jason Hartman. Welcome to the Speaking of Wealth Show. This is your host, Jason Hartman, where we discuss profit strategies for speakers, publishers, authors, consultants, coaches, info marketers, and just go over a whole bunch of exciting things that you can use to increase your business, to make your business more successful and more and more passive and more and more automated and more and more scalable. So we will be back with a great interview. Be sure to visit us at speakingofwealth.com. You can take advantage of our blog, subscribe subscribe to the RSS feed and many other resources for free at speakingofwealth.com. And we will be back with a great interview for you in less than 60 seconds. If you want to be a successful investor, you need to learn the truth about where to invest and how to create wealth from someone who does it successfully every day, Jason Hartman. And Jason's number one piece of advice, pretend the stock market doesn't exist. Thousands of people are growing wealthy by pulling their money out of the stock market and putting it into what has proven year after year to be history's best investment, rental property. And now Jason has developed the Creating Wealth online course, a six-week intensive interactive webinar that teaches you exactly what steps to take to begin investing in rental properties immediately. And you'll get intensive real estate training, no esoteric theory. Just a simple, repeatable, conservative approach that can make you very wealthy. Classes are online and priced at just $197. Register for the Creating Wealth online course at www.jasonhartman.com. My pleasure to welcome Ann Hogan to the show. She is the community manager at the Humane Society. She spoke at Blog World in New York City recently and talked about blogger outreach. And it is very important as marketers, as podcasters, bloggers, speakers, whatever, that we have an engaged community. Not just a big bunch of numbers, but true engagement from our community. And Anne is an expert on that. And you know, with her involvement in the Humane Society, this is a subject that is very near and dear to my heart. And the, the, the good treatment of animals and, and the humane treatment of them. And Anne, welcome. It's a pleasure to have you today. And you're coming to us today from Washington, D.C., right? Yes, I am. Well, good. Well, what is your typical day as community manager at the Humane Society? Well, my typical day starts, the very first thing I do is check our Facebook page, obviously. And one thing that's been great with the shift to timeline is the admin panel at the top, which is very helpful for me because instead of then manually going through all of our posts to see where people may have posted new comments, it's all right up there in that notification area for me. And so I go through and see where people have commented on either our status or just posted on our wall and respond to them and engage them, answer questions. We get a lot of questions on our Facebook page, and they generally fall into a couple FAQs, as it were, but I make sure to go through and answer all of those for people, um, whether it's directing them to resources on our website or getting them in touch with someone at HSUS who could help them more, or even just giving them answers. Sometimes they'll just want to know um, a little bit more information about maybe one of our posts or one of our campaigns. And so I make sure to go through and answer everyone, and also delete spam. And, and delete spam. Now, just since you mentioned spam, how much of a problem is that? And you know, I'm kind of wondering, is that, is that spam computer generated? How are they breaking into Facebook to do that? I kind of never really understood that completely. One thing that I've noticed is that the spam tends to come in waves. Every once in a while, for a few days at a time, we'll see a bunch of posts about, you know, click here to get a free iPad. And they generally come from people's profiles. And I really think it's a lot like the Twitter direct message spam where someone has clicked a link and their account has gotten hacked or someone has managed to get into their account. Because when you look at these profiles of people who are posting this spam on our walls, it's not a spam profile. It's a regular person's Facebook profile. It's very obvious that they're an average user. And so we generally delete those spam. We don't block the people 
sometimes we will get a message from someone saying, I'm so sorry, my account was hacked and this spam message was posted on every page that I'm a fan of. And so, and I think since it does tend to come in waves, what I'm, my guess is that what's happening is some sort of developer, we'll call them, has figured out a way to get into someone's Facebook. And they've done it until Facebook cracks down and closes that loophole. And then it takes them a while to find another one and then they release it again. Yeah, yeah, and it's just an ongoing thing we all have to manage. I, I wanted to ask you that question before we moved on because it is a big part of this, of maintaining the page. You know, I was disappointed. It's not a big deal, obviously, but I, I, I made, for the first time in my life, I made a comment on the Starbucks page, making a suggestion for Starbucks, and nobody ever responded. Nobody ever answered. I thought big companies like that, especially sort of hip, cool companies like Starbucks, would have all sorts of people like Ann Hogan that would be managing their pages and replying and responding and nothing. <laughs> yeah, and I think that's a big part of it. Sometimes we'll have people who will post something on our page, and sometimes it's a complaint where they're saying, I don't like XYZ, and we respond, and they'll say, oh my goodness, I did not expect an actual person to read this and respond to it. Thank you. And it's a great way for us to turn people around. You know, you've got someone who's frustrated and venting their frustrations on Facebook. And when you can fix that for them, suddenly they're really impressed. A a absolutely. I, I tell you that the person that you turn around, that, that disgruntled customer can really become your best advocate. That is such a huge opportunity for marketers, for brands, for companies, for small businesses, anybody to, when you respond and you act in a responsive, responsible manner, and you don't just delete complaints and ignore them like some, some companies do, you have an opportunity to turn that person around and really make them your, your best advocate and, and, and your best spokesperson. It's, it's, it's an incredible opportunity. Any, any more comment on that type of thing? Well, the only other thing I would say about that is with cleaning up spam, it goes a long way to encouraging people to post on your Facebook wall with their questions, concerns, even just to say, hi, how are you? Because if you go to a Facebook page and you see that the posts from others are all just a bunch of spam, you're not going to want to engage with that page because what that tells you is that they're not really paying attention. And so even doing something as simple as going through and deleting free iPad offers helps make your page seem more engaging and makes your brand seem more responsive. Yeah, no question about it. So here's an example. Looking at your page for the Humane Society, that's the Humane Society of the United States, facebook.com slash humane society. Yesterday, there is a post here, and it's about the chimpanzees. And it, it, I mean, look at the engagement from just one post yesterday. 951 people like it, 33 comments, but here's the big one. And, 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 the, and the viral nature, 369 people shared this post. And that's just since yesterday. And that may have been late in the day yesterday. I'd say that's pretty impressive, isn't it? Yeah, we're, that's one thing that we, we really pay attention to. And we look at you know, the likes, the comments, and the shares. And we go through and try and figure out which types of posts get, generate those that engagement and post more like that. The chimp issue is one that a lot of people really care about and are very passionate about. And so, you know, we give them this opportunity to share it. We also make sure that all of our posts share very easily and nicely, and that when we pull it in... You, what, what does that mean, share easily and nicely? What are you doing to the post to make it easier? I mean, Facebook, the software of Facebook does that, but is it the fact that, that it has a good, maybe a good image or picture to go with it when it's shared? Exactly. We yeah. try to make it look pretty. And that, you know, when we share something, we want to make sure first and foremost that it works. And so for this particular one, it's an action alert. And we keep people in Facebook because we know that if you're on Facebook, you probably don't want to just get booted off to our website. So if you click on that alert, it will take you to a custom Facebook tab with an API that will allow you to take action right there. But if you're on a mobile phone and can't get to tabs, we have a split redirect in there, so it will take you to our website. So no matter what device you're accessing Facebook from, it will work for you. And we made sure that when we have that link right there. It's got a good headline that tells you what it is, a nice little summary that 
again, just very quickly tells you what this is that you're going to click on and a good picture. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. I'm not sure you have an answer to this one, but I want to just throw it out there for your, your consideration. And that is, in your line of work, I mean, this is the Humane Society. This is a cause. A lot of people believe in the cause, and a lot of people are very passionate about it, Anne, which is a great thing. However, if someone listening is a, a blogger, a marketer, maybe they're in the business world, and it's not not cause oriented. I think with a cause you have a lot of fervent passion, but you don't with a, a, a business, you know, someone who runs a consulting business or has a coffee shop, for example, locally. What, what can these people learn, if anything, from the Humane Society in terms of getting shares, getting the viral component, getting engagement and interaction on their pages? Well, I think that with any company, you're going to have people who are passionate about your work. There are people who are passionate about coffee and about social media. And one of the biggest things you can do is to ask people. No matter what your business is, you can ask people, here's this new study on social media marketing. What do you think? What are your thoughts on this? Um, you can ask for feedback and saying, tell us what you think on a post will increase that engagement. Instead of just saying, here's this new study, well, okay, I'm going to read it or whatever, but saying, what do you think about this? Or even pulling out one specific note from that study or that new research or this new product that you have. You know, we just introduced cinnamon coffee lattes. What do you think? What flavor would you like to see? How do you drink your coffee? Anything that really kind of asks people their opinion really makes them feel valued and feel like you really want their engagement. You don't care about them as a number. You don't want their shares. You care about them as a person and their opinions, their passions, and their feedback. So really asking a question, that's the most basic way to, to answer that, right? Ask yeah. questions to get engagement rather than making statements, just at its most simple level, right? Right. Yeah. Okay. Good. What uh, What are some of the other best practices for engagement? You know, maybe you want to talk a little bit, Anne, about just getting more people to, first of all, like the page. And at the beginning of this interview, I, I mentioned that it's really not about numbers. It's about engagement, the number of likes, which so many people are still focused on. You know, I've got 5,000 likes, 10,000 likes, but are they engaging? Are they interacting with the page? But the first thing you've got to do is get them to like the page before they can interact. Well, and one great way to do that is also by having content that people share so that then your posts are visible in the news feeds of people who don't like your page and they can see some of the work that you're doing. One thing that I personally respond to in my news feed when I see it are infographics. They're very popular right now. People love them. I love them. And so if someone shares a really cool infographic, I'll click over to that Facebook page and say, oh, you know, I didn't know that this page existed, but they've got some cool content. And I'll like that page. And so that increases your engagement and increases your visibility. I would agree. An infographic's a great thing because it's sort of a form of shorthand, isn't it? Rather yeah. than someone, you know, we all get so much to read in our news feed. People share stuff with us, articles. And nowadays, people are so busy. An infographic can really kind of simplify things, can it? Absolutely. And it also grabs your attention. You know, I mean, you could have some text bullet pointed, and it could be the most interesting information in the world. But if I just see that text scrolling through my Facebook feed, it's not going to grab me. But that same exact information presented visually will snag my attention and make me look at it and really absorb that information. Yeah. Well, any thoughts on, you know, and I don't know if this is something that maybe the Humane Society does internally, but creating and generating infographics, of course you can share other infographics that you find, but anything on creating them from scratch, I mean, a website like Gliffy, gliffy.com might be helpful for that, but, you know, are there any other sources to create them? Well, we do them internally. Um, we have a fabulous graphic designer who does ours for us, but there are great ways to do them online. You can obviously hire a firm to do one for you, but that can be quite costly. Like you mentioned, Gliffy is great. I really love PicMonkey and their collages because you can just set up the collage, drop your information right in there, add some text, edit it however you want. It's a free service. It's fun to play around with. It's one that I really enjoy for personal use, but would make really cool infographics. Excellent, excellent point. So infographics, of course, video works very well. Any other, any other tips on what to share and how to get people engaged more? Well, we like to vary our posts. 
as far as, you know, we don't post a video every day or a picture. We like to mix it up so that you're not always getting the same type of content because obviously different people respond to different types of content. And so we want to make sure that there really is something for everyone. And so we'll have links, sometimes just a straight status update, a video, a photo, all different types of posts just to mix it up and also so that when you come to our page you're not just seeing a wall of videos or a wall of links. And we're not always asking people to do something. We like to do what we call it Take Action Tuesday, which is when we will ask you to contact your senators, contact a company, actually you know, fill out an action alert and do something. But then we'll also have days when we're just saying, hey, here's a cute video. Check it out. Mm -hmm. Right, right. And are, any thoughts on how often to post? Are you just posting once a day or more often than that? We post once a day because we found that that's the sweet spot for our audience. It's different for every page. And so what I would suggest doing is really monitoring your insights. And again, with the new timeline admin panel, it's great. It makes it really easy to do that. But kind of look and see. If you notice that you're posting three times a day and getting a lot of unsubscribes, slow it down. Yeah, right, right, because you're just, you're just clogging up people's news feed. And right, they don't, they because don't you're flooding people. And also make sure that you know, you're not just posting for the sake of posting. Right. You're actually providing some value and useful information for people. And I really like the concept of Take Action Tuesday. So it's also interesting, and you probably thought that out, not to do that on Monday when everybody's sort of busy catching up from the weekend. So Tuesday is the day that you actually ask people to do something. Now, are the other days of the week, are they oriented just at sort of informational content or, or cute, funny content? Or do you also have some, some other themes today besides well, Tuesday? Well, we do. Um, we have Fun Friday which is always something light and fun because it is Friday. People are, a lot of people aren't online on Fridays or they're already thinking about the weekend and already kind of mentally checked out. And so we do Fun Friday, which is last Friday it was a cute video. Sometimes it's a funny picture, but it's always just something very light and just pure fun. And then the other days of the week are typically informational. We mix it up. It depends a lot on what we have going on. And so we don't really have those as structured as Tuesday and Friday to give us just to give us a little leeway for breaking news and other things like that. And just mention if you would other platforms. It sounds like Facebook is really your mainstay, but you've got about 100,000 Twitter followers, right? We do. And Twitter is another great one. That's another one where we do have a couple of different memes for different days. We do Mutt Mondays and Feline Fridays. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> send us pictures of your pets and we uh, retweet a lot of those and we've got some shelters that participate and send us some adoptable pets that we can tweet out and get the word out on those. We also use Twitter as a customer service tool. We have a lot of different searches, not just for our at replies, but also for anyone who mentions just Humane Society in general. And so, you know, if they're saying, I tried emailing Humane Society and they won't get back to me, we can at reply them and say, hey, what do you need? Right, here we are. Right, yeah, yeah, can we get you somebody? Um, and that's another one where people are, oh, oh my goodness, I did not expect a response. <laughs> so we do a lot there. And we also do a lot of breaking news on Twitter. Um, with the recent fires out west, we did a lot of funneling information for people on pet evacuations and shelters and things like that. And there are probably lost pets and so forth whenever there's a fire or anything like that. Right. And so we'll tweet out the information, you know, call this number if you've lost or found a pet. Now, you mentioned before we started recording today, I asked you about Google+. And, you know, you said that the audience really wasn't there. Now, of course, it's new. But w was that platform just not as appropriate in some way? Or, or, or it's just that the audience wasn't there yet? Wh which one? You know, I really think it's the audience because I had, I personally had really high hopes for Google Plus because, you know, the way that they have videos and photos so prominently displayed in their feed, I thought that would just really lend itself very well to our work in showcasing some of our photos and videos. But it didn't end up working out like that. And so I really think it was just that our audience isn't there. I think it is because it's new. They just aren't over there yet. And so we still have the, the presence and, you know, we might revisit it a little bit later and see, maybe try some different things and rework our strategy a little bit to better suit the audience that is there. Sure, sure. And Anne, what about off social media initiatives? I mean, are, are, is, are you or is the Humane Society in general doing, you know, anything in particular with its website, its blog? Does the social media really, has that really become the place for your organization? Well, our website will always be our main 
place, our main hub. That's where you know, we've got so many resources and information, all of our breaking news and new campaigns and things like that live on our website. And we have a web team that does phenomenal work and works very hard to keep that updated and current. Um, and we also, our CEO has a blog that goes out four or five times a week, Monday through Friday. And that goes out to email subscribers. We also tweet it every day. Um, and so I think of it more as the website being home base, so to speak, and then our social media efforts driving from that. Are, are there any metrics that you've developed, and these are probably impossible to track, but I'll just ask, in terms of the amount of donation money raised from, say, the Facebook page? We absolutely track that. Yeah. Well, I mean, can you track that it's directly from Facebook, though? We can. Um, we use, uh, through Convio, which is now Blackbaud, I have to get used to saying that, we put source links on all of our donation forms so that any time we, we do a donation ask on Facebook, we can track it. And we also can track if someone came from Facebook to another web page and then ended up on a donation form and donating. We can track that as well. And Convio is C-O-N-V-I-O. I just looked it up. And I guess they changed their name. That's a, a, a black bod, B-A-U-D, right, company? Yes. Okay. And that's something nonprofits use to gather and track donations then? Right. It's a CMS platform. Okay, great. And what is the Humane Society working on nowadays? What's big for you? What are your initiatives? Well, right now we are working on the Animal Spectator Fighting Act, which was an amendment that was added to the Farm Bill and would outlaw spectator, would make being a spectator at an animal fight illegal, which it currently is not. And so it would be another way to crack down on animal fighting. Well, I, I suppose that it's interesting that you say that. I suppose the thing with these this disgusting animal fighting, I mean, this is just awful. You know, what they do with the roosters and the dogs, it's just unbelievable. People are really interested in this stuff. But, uh, you know, I suppose what some of the thing that's hard about that and why there needs to be a spectator law is because maybe sometimes when they find out about these rings of people doing this, they don't know who's really putting on the show. I mean, it's it's illegal to put it on, right? But, you right. know, maybe they can't figure out who's really doing it. And Exactly, and that's the problem in a lot of cases. And you know, you've got they'll do a raid and there's a lot of people there and it's very easy for them to say, well, that's not my dog. Right. Yes, the Spectator Act is very important and will be a great tool for cracking down on that. What else is the Humane Society working on? Well, we've also got, as you noticed, our uh, Grade 8 Protection and Cost Savings Act, which would help with chimps in research labs. There are hundreds of chimps around the country currently in research labs. Some of them are not even being used. They're just languishing in these cages. And so that act would um, save taxpayer money as well as helping get these chimps into sanctuary. Good, good stuff. And how big is the Humane Society in terms of an organization? You're in D.C. Is that, is that where it's based? Yes. We are headquartered in D.C. and we have um, state directors in almost every state as well as a Hollywood office. And we've got I believe about 500 employees. And a Hollywood office, just because you want to be near the entertainment industry to hopefully impart the message through movies and TV and so forth? Absolutely. And we also um, work with celebrities to leverage their audiences in helping to get our message out. Uh -huh. Okay, great. Good. Well, Anne Hogan, thank you so much for joining us today and talking to us about engagement. Is there anything else you'd like people to know? Well, I think the most important thing is to respect your fans and appreciate them. And remember that each one is important. It doesn't matter, you know, if they have five Facebook friends or 5,000, to really treat everyone the same and respond, engage them, and then they'll engage you. And the page, facebook.com slash humane society, did you want to give out any other websites or resources? Yeah, uh, our Twitter is twitter.com slash humane society. One word. And our website is humanesociety.org. Fantastic. Ann Hogan, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Now's your opportunity to get the Financial Freedom Report. The Financial Freedom Report provides financial self-defense in uncertain times, and it's your source for innovative, forward-thinking investment property strategies and advice. Get your newsletter subscription today. You get a digital download and even more. Go to jasonhartman.com to get yours today. This show is produced by the Hartman Media Company, all rights reserved. For distribution or publication rights and media interviews, please visit www.hartmanmedia.com or email media at hartmanmedia.com.
Nothing on this show should be considered specific personal or professional advice. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, or business professional for individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own, and the host is acting on behalf of Platinum Properties Investor Network, Inc. exclusively.